Um, I heard a story about a small Midwestern town that was a dry town, um, but not legally. It just had always been a dry town, and then one local entrepreneur decided to open a bar. And so in the process of opening bar, the, uh, the little church in town got, got a little um, upset about that, and so they started doing petitions and prayer meetings to try to shut down you know, this bar. And the bar owner was very, very nice and cordial and, and, and didn't take offense to that, just kept moving forward with his plans until the night before the bar opened, and then there was a lightning strike, and the lightning struck the bar and burned it to the ground. So when it burned it to the ground, then the church people got a little puffed up, a little, little pious about, you know, you know, about you know, their prayer. And um, until they got the notice to come to court because he was suing them for being indirectly responsible for the destruction of the bar. And so, well, they, they fought the lawsuit. They said, we didn't have anything to do with, we didn't have anything to do with the, the fire at the, at the bar. And so when, when it was the first hearing and lawyers were there and, and um, the judge was very confused and he called the lawyers up and he said, I'm really confused about this case. And they said, well, what do you, what do you mean? He said, well, I've got a bar, bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and I got a church that doesn't. It's a joke. I made this story. Uh, no, someone else made it up. I just stole it. Um, you guys are a little bit more lively on the weekend. It, I, I said it was a little humor in our first service. The emphasis on little. Um, but <laughs> today I'm going to talk about prayer. And uh, as the fourth installment of this No Holding Back series, that in this season that we're going into, the four things that the Lord, I believe, is wanting us to kind of get in the current of um, was around evangelism, discipleship, um, leadership, and prayer. And this morning, I want us to talk about prayer. For a multitude of reasons, prayer seems to be very elusive to Christians, um, meaning it's something that we talk, we'll talk more about than we actually do. And so when I, when I drill down into that, even in my own life, why, why would I talk about prayer and encourage prayer much more than I actually practice prayer. I drilled down and I've come up with three, I think, pretty reasonable um, explanations. Reasonable just meaning that they're, I think they're real, not that we should live, uh, abide by them. One is that we grossly underestimate the magnitude of the relationship we have with God through Christ. I'll explain that in a minute. But we grossly underestimate the magnitude of the relationship we have with Christ as a reason why we don't pray as much. The second is that we're grossly over-dependent on our own power to do life and make things happen. We are grossly over-dependent on our own ability to do life and make things happen. And here's the third. We are grossly in the dark regarding the spiritual role we play in God's unfolding drama. Key word in all that was grossly pulled out my middle school vocabulary for today. And we grossly underestimate in one case. We grossly overestimate in another case. And in another case, we, we disregard, grossly disregard the role that God has for us to play in this, his drama at his invitation. When I, when I, when I broke into the No Holding Back series, I used um, some unique terms to, to relate to discipleship, leadership, evangelism, and prayer. And that's where the power rested. Um, the first I talked about three weeks ago was evangelism synergy. I felt like the Lord was pushing us into a season that heightened evangelism synergy. Now, what does that mean? It means that we work together for the cause of the kingdom. Let me give you a good example. That even today, there is evangelism synergy happening because somebody's watching today or you might have come into the room today exploring Christianity to try to discover, is Jesus real? Is he all that he says he is or is he not? And if you have kids, someone is taking such good care of your children today that your mind doesn't even really need to go there because you were greeted warmly with a smile. You were giving a security tag. They're even going to get a snack and I'm not going to feed you anything. Someone made coffee today, ground the beans and put it in a cup so conversation could happen. See, it, we, we work together to create an environment where someone can discover who Jesus is. This week I got a telephone message from one of the members talking about um, some, a co-worker and how a conversation they had regarding Christ and it prompted me to pray for their co-worker. That's evangelism synergy. That's working together. Talked about leadership expansion. Expansion. That anytime, anytime something expands, it creates a gap of leadership. 
Anytime your family expands, there's a gap. There's a lot of gaps in there. There's financial gaps. There's, right? and there's a lot of gaps that happen. But in any kind of organization that grows, it creates a gap in leadership. And what happens when someone steps into that gap and provides leadership, something always grows. Leadership always grows. And then we talked about um, discipleship tenacity. That there, there's, there's so much at work against becoming like Christ that it takes, it takes a tenacious spirit to engage that. Tenacity defined as not easily pulled apart. Not easily pulled apart. So I'm going to, I said that so much around church and Christianity ends up getting, getting, um, getting put on the do, someone's doing shoulders, that we're supposed to do all of this stuff. But all of our doing as a follower of Christ comes from our becoming, not our doing, not our duty, not our obligation. It's, it's fruit of roots. And so there's, it's, there's an overflowing that we're, we're to become, and discipleship is becoming, and we should be tenacious to become. And that leads us today about prayer. Today's adjective is advancing prayer. Advancing prayer. Advancing has multiple nuances to it that I want to talk about. The first is when you go to advance a cause, you want to kind of bring attention to, right? So I want to, I want to advance the cause of prayer. And there's a very key to that that we'll get to. I want to advance the cause of prayer in your life. The second nuance to the word advance would be to change, um, change priority, change position, Okay? And, that, and that so often we react to things that happen in our life and we don't respond in prayer. So I want to advance prayer away from our, our normal go-tos. I want to advance it in position of how you do and handle life. And the third would be we advance because of prayer. That, that the very fact that when we move forward, we will move forward in prayer. Prayer will be what actually makes the way forward. Three kinds of advancing we'll talk about today. Let's talk about the first one, about the idea of um, advancing prayer forward the cause of prayer. Every major religion has a way to communicate with their gods. Some call it prayer. Some call it meditation. Um, some use a series of rituals. But all of them is a mechanism of a tool and way to communicate with their, their god. Six, seven or eight years ago was my last trip to India. Where I've been to India in and out has been in the, the, well, it's the most northern state of India that you're allowed to go if you're not Indian. So in the, when you hear all the ruckus between Pakistan and India, it's over land rights on Kashmir. The, the state right below Kashmir is the Himachal Pradesh, and that's where I've spent my time. Well, most of the time I would fly into Delhi and I'd get a little prop plane. The little prop plane would crest the Himalayan mountain range. It would snake a canyon, drop me off about an hour Jeep ride away, and then we'd go up to India. Well, on this last trip I took with my wife, my daughter, and Micah, Annie's best friend, um, the, the government had shut down that aircraft. So we actually had to hire a driver. So we had uh, a Toyota SUV, a Toyota 4Runner, with five people, and three of those five people were female for a 10-day trip. All right, so, and, and not in code is we had a whole boatload of luggage. And we're all crammed into this SUV for a 14-hour nonstop drive. Once we kind of cleared the plains and we started up into the mountain ranges, the, the roads got steep, they got narrow, they got windy. And on one particular occasion, the driver came to kind of to an abrupt halt. And there was a lot of cars in this area. And he fumbled around and found a bottle of water, and he exited the vehicle. It was going about 10 minutes. When, when he came back, I, I inquired. I said, well, what, what, was this, you know, what was this about? And he said, well, there's a temple here, and the God of this valley is very powerful. So I went to offer, give an offering for our safety. Now, I admired his devotion. I admired devotion in people. Devotion is character. But the power doesn't rest in our devotion. It rests in who we're devoted to. Now, there are, there are over a billion Hindus in the world who would think that everyone else is not enlightened. And they worship thousands and thousands of gods. 
And I would say, based on that one experience I had, so much of that worship, in that case, from him anyway, was prompted out of fear. There, there was, if, if, this, if I don't do this, something might happen. But there is, a, there is built into their religion, and all religions, a way to connect with their, with their God. Now, what about us Westerners? Our Westerners, as a Western person, we don't worship thousands of gods. We primarily worship one, and it's us. God created us in his image, and then we've been trying to return the favor ever since. Create him in our image. If you've ever said or heard someone say, well, I, I, if I was God, I wouldn't do that. Or, well, I can't worship a God like that. What have we done? We have elevated ourselves to God. And if he's not going to measure up to us, then we don't have nothing to do with him. If he doesn't meet our expectations, well, then I'm going to push him down here. That, that's the idea of we're worshiping ourselves. The, the atheist worships their intellect. That they have come to a conclusion that there is no God. This life is all that there is. They're worshiping themselves. We're all going to worship something. We're going to worship other gods, gods we create, or we're going to worship ourselves. But it's really kind of futile. Here's how the psalmist says it in 115, 1 through 8. And this will tell you why the psalmist hits both a Western mind that will worship themselves and maybe an Eastern mind that will worship idols. It says, not to who? Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory. He has to state it that way because our minds will go to us. Um, because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all that who trust in them. The reason why God is so adamant against false worship isn't because he has an ego problem. It's because we become like who we worship. John Piper, famous pastor, he has a, he has a line in relation to this passage where he says that um, our God carries, their God has to be carried. It's a great line. Our God carries. Idols have to be, they have to be carried. So when I get to the idea of prayer and why we don't pray and it becomes an underestimation of, of our relationship with God and who God is, we have to shift and have a, have to, we have to have a better understanding of really the magnitude of the love that he has for us. Because I, I think at, at, at the, our level of understanding of the magnitude of God's love for us increases our desire to pray. Where do we learn the most of God's love for us? The cross. The cross is the quintessential representation of God's love for us. And a number of things happened on the cross. The first thing that happened on the cross was justification. Justification is a legal term. We were legally bound. We had broken his law, and that was a legal law that was broken. We sinned. We, we, had, we were legally on the hook. There was no reasonable doubt. We were legally on the hook. And when Jesus dies on the cross for us, he, what he does is he takes that legal rendering that's against us and he takes it on himself. He doesn't say they're not guilty. What he says is their penalty, I will pay. I will pay on their behalf to remove the legal indebtedness that they have. I'll take that. That is a demonstration of his love. The second thing happens is redemption. Redemption happens on the cross. 
In the ancient world, if you were in debt, you could be thrown into prison or you would have to, be, you have to go into a slave position with the person you owed. And the only way that, cha- that changed is someone had to buy you out of that slavery. Okay? They had to redeem you out of that slavery. Well, Scripture says that we were slaves to sin. We had to be bought back. We had to be redeemed from that. And that redemption was his blood on the cross. It took his blood on the cross to redeem us. Justification, redemption happened on the cross. Reconciliation happens on the cross. Before there was sin, Scripture says that God would enter the garden in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve, and they would have relationship face to face. But when they sinned, that ceased. It doesn't come back around until the incarnation, when Jesus becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us. The the, the biggest penalty of sin was the separation there was between God and his creation. There was a need to be reconciled. You probably, no doubt, have had relationships in your life that have been severed. Most everybody I would speak to, there is some close relationship, whether friend or family, somewhere that was severed. And you probably can still feel, if you, if you allow yourself, you can still feel the pain of that severance. But there's also some of you that, that's been reconciled. And you, you would have a hard time even finding words to express the joy of being reconciled again. And that's what ha- took place on the cross was this age-old separation gets reconciled. When Scripture says that God casts our sin as far as the east from the west, it's not not saying He doesn't remember it. I mean, it's not possible for God not to remember. What it's saying is God no longer holds that account to our account. So you and I, if you're anything like me, I don't forget my sin. I, I keep a pretty run dialogue, catalog, you know. I, and, but listen, here's the thing. It doesn't define me. It, 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 they're not open wounds anymore. They're scars, and scars tell stories. I've been reconciled. The Scripture says that we are made new. We are a new creation. We don't, you don't, we don't get a little bondo and a slap of paint. He remakes us inside out. And in that making, we are We are reconciled to him. That's a big honking deal. The fourth thing that happens on the cross is worship. Christ shows us what it means to worship. How, Pastor? I know it's popular to say that if if, if we were the only one on the planet and Jesus knows us and Jesus would have died for us, and I do not disagree with that. But Jesus goes to the cross out of the love the Father has for us. God, for God so loved the world that he gave. Okay? Jesus goes to the cross in love and obedience to his Father and in love of us. What is the best definition of worship? Obedience, surrender. When I obey and surrender to the Lord, when I give myself to Him, that's worship. And He shows us what that looks like on the cross. And the last is victory. Victory gets had on the cross. Sin and death, they ruled the day for centuries. There was no way out of sin, and there was no way out of death. And on the cross, sin's power gets disarmed. It exists. The opportunity exists, but it was disarmed. It no longer had the kind of control over me and you that it had prior to Jesus' death. And then death is defeated. Death is not the end. This is not all there is. There's a future. So how do I define God's love? I define it by justification, redemption, reconciliation worship, victory. And when I understand the magnitude of that love, then I'm drawn to him. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest 
who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, and yet he did not sin. As a result of Christ, then the right of Hebrews says we can do this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. With confidence, is a big, it's a, that's a big thing right here. Approach the throne of grace with confidence. I don't, because of the cross, I don't have to back into a prayer. I don't have to back into God's promise. If it was up to me, if it was up to my life, I would have to back in. But if it's up to the cross, I don't have to back in. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Here's the big deal. Prayer's primary motivation is relational, not transactional. See, when I see prayer as a transaction, one, I'm only going to go to prayer when there's a transaction that's needed. And then two, if it's a transaction, then I'm going to always be wanting to plead my case. And I can tell you, I know that we do this. Lord, I've been a good boy this week. It's like Christmas list. Santa, I've been good this year. Or we go in saying, I know that we haven't talked in a while. Or I know I don't deserve this. Well, that's transactional. We're, we're, we're measuring, do we earn it? Do we not earn it? We have a good week, we have a bad week. That's transactional. Instead of it being, it's relational. He goes to the cross relationally. Transaction is done. Sin's defeated. But it goes relational. Let me, let me just, the best way I can illustrate this. My daughter is only a semester away from graduation. But that, what that means is, for the last three and a half years, there has been a monthly allotment that I put in her account to cover expenses. And for all the college students in here, if you want me to help you negotiate a better rate after service, come see me. Now, when she calls me and says, Dad, I'm out of money, but I'm not out a month. If it was just transactional, I'd say no. Honey, you, you know the rules. I don't care if the month has 28 days, 30 days, 31 days. It's this much money. It's a month. You know it going in. It's a transaction. You got your part. I got my part. I fulfilled my part. You didn't fulfill your part. Is that how the conversation goes? It doesn't go like that. She's not calling. If she's calling to try to plead her case, she already knows. She ain't going to win. She ain't going to win. The, she's not going to win that call. But she doesn't call because it's a transaction. She calls because I'm her dad. There's a relational pull to the call. And if she only called me when she was out of money, I wouldn't take the call. Best bumper sticker I ever saw. Money isn't everything, but it sure keeps the kids in touch. But she's calling relationally, and we have a discussion about what's happened. And you know what? Sometimes the answer is still no. Sometimes yes is not the best answer. But you know what? The bulk of the time, you know what the answer is, don't you? It's yes. It's not a negotiation. It's not how you're going to pay me back. Are you going to do better next week? It's yes. Yes. Because it, it's a relational call. And she knows after 21 years, I can call mom. I can call dad. I spent 21 years building up that kind of trust. And we're not milk toast, But she's not afraid to call. See, when we understand the relationship we have with God through Christ, that's why you can't understand a relationship with God without Christ. Because Christ is the one who defines the relationship. The cross defines the relationship. And we lose sight of that. And when you get the magnitude of the cross, you get the magnitude of the relationship. So the cause of prayer, advancing the cause of prayer is, listen, he did that thousands of years ago for you and me. He hasn't reneged on that. He hasn't gone back and said, I wish I went to a smaller cross. On a smaller hill outside of a smaller city. It's done with all of us in mind. And he's saying, the way I created for you and I to build the relationship is prayer. I've given it to you. It's a gift. It's not a transaction 
We're not here to do business together. We're here to build blood. Annie's my blood. We are blood with Christ. We're his brother. We are co-heirs. We are joint heirs. This is what allows us to pray. This is why the writer of Hebrews says, you can come boldly with confidence into the throne of grace. Assured that you will receive mercy, what you don't deserve. And grace, which you can never earn. You can be assured of that. Listen, sometimes there are still no's, but they come out of mercy and grace. The only reason why we get bent out of shape with a no from God is when it's transactional. How do you get bent out of shape with a father who sends his son to die? You can't get bent out of shape with a God like that unless we're just so hell-bent on having a transaction taken care of. We grossly underestimate the love of God. We cheapen the love of God to Him just saying yes all the time. All right. I got to move on, don't I? Wow, we talk about the cross in April. That's advancing the cause of prayer. Trying to make the case for you of why and how we can pray. Second is we advance the priority of prayer. Okay? So we, we want to shift the position of prayer. All right? We generally react, we react to life, believing that somehow our activity is progress. But in essence, what we're called to do is move our reactions from our activity to move it to prayer. Prayer is an indicator of faith. We are a DYL culture, DYI culture. We place more confidence in our own abilities. We want to take credit for our victories. We need to move up priority in our faith. Um, I, this is the first story I made up. The second, this, this one's true. Got to qualify that. Um, young Bible translator. Uh, I, I can't document it exactly, but it was a young, young Bible translator with a specific dialect, a specific tribe uh, in, in a certain country. And he was having trouble um, uh, translating a particular verse, uh, passage of Scripture because there was no word in their dialect for faith. And so he had a young translator helping him with, with the culture. And they were having a discussion over what what. what Help me figure out how I communicate this word faith. You remember grade school or middle school, high school, you'd lean, your chi- you'd lean your chair back on the back two feet, you know, before they made you wear helmets and knee pads doing it. And, and, right? and so, so while they're having this discussion of trying to figure out what this word is, he leaned back on his chair and his friend said, that's it. We have a word for that. The word we have for that, what you're doing is leaning your whole weight upon. We have a word for that. And that became the word they translated for faith. That is faith. Leaning our whole weight upon. See, that's what prayer is. When I choose to move prayer as a priority, that it's a response to life, then I'm leaning my whole weight upon. It doesn't mean that I don't get up and get busy. But it means I get down first before I get busy. Because that's where the creativity, that's where the light's going to come from. That's where, that's where ways get made when there's no ways. We shift it. We got to shift it in priority. God is a, has a fierce expectation that we go to him first. Pastor, prove that. I'm going to prove it to you. But God, I want, you, I want that to sink in. God has a fierce expectation that you go to him first. You know, I'd, I'd be almost ticked at Annie if she was in serious need and she tried to work it out on her own without calling me. So here's the passage. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It may be familiar, but I want you to hear it through the light of he fiercely expects us to come to him first. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, 
which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do not become anxious about anything. All right. I'll give you this progression. Worry. We have worry first. That's the first thing we do is worry. Okay? And then we become anxious. What's anxious? Ag- anxiousness is advanced worry. So we're, actually we go activity, then we go worry, then we go anxious, and then we go fear. Fear is advanced anxiousness. And that's our progression. So why does God give us this passage through Paul in Philippians? Because he knows our propensity for worry, anxiousness, and fear. Is it because that's a part of our nature? No. Our nature can be found in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. Now, the Amplified, Tyler, put that verse up for me in the Amplified so I don't have to go back and get it in my notes. 2 Timothy 1 7. I'll go back to my notes. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and love and sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. So if that's not how we're created, then why, why, why his understanding of Philippians 4, 6? Let me tell you why. Because he completely understands the impact of sin. That's not how we created, but he understands what sin t- takes from us and creates this breach of relationship in our mind or, or in actuality. And so he tells us, do not be anxious for anything. So it is completely inclusive that there isn't one thing to be anxious over before prayer. Because he says, what's his response? In everything, come to me in prayer. But what's his response? His response isn't always just to take it away. And he goes ahead and tells us that in this verse. What's his response? He says that I will, I will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, that there would be a peace beyond your ability to comprehend. Now, the word guard there is a military term. It is a century taking up post. How many military families we have in here? Any military families? When you were assigned to sentry duty, right, there were no breaks. You were, you were to walk that post. That was your responsibility. That was your post. And he says that I will guard your hearts and minds. Why both? Some people are more emotional, okay? We emote more than we think. And there are some thinkers that will think before they emote. Now, we, both, we do all both, but some, something's going to lead us. Emotion's going to lead us or thinking's going to lead us. But both of them lead to worry and anxiousness and fear. And God sends his peace. So he's, not, so he's saying there are times and there are ways that I am the way maker. But the way that you're going to walk through any way that I make is going to be with me. With me. With me. And that's what he's saying here. When, when, when there is prayer, when we pray, we are, we're inviting God into the mix with us. And he's going to be with us. And his manner with us is peace. Peace. And it will guard, it will shoot anything on its way to, to our heart and mind. Listen, when, when, when we see things in our life and we go to God over, well, this is a really big thing, God, or I'm not going to bother you because this is a small thing, God, we are already acting like God. You know why? Because big and small are relative terms to us because we're measuring them against our ability or resources. Is there actually anything big and small to God? Or just, just walk with me logically. God doesn't have big and small, big or small. It's a relative term. Who's going to be relative to God? So why would I not go to him something I think is small and only go to him something I think big or don't go with him something big because I don't see how it's going to happen? It doesn't make any sense. There's no, lo- there's no logic to it for our thinkers in here. 
Big and small is relative to me and not to God. So I take everything to him in prayer. I was, it's funny, I was the kid. Tuesday night, Tuesday night was, I had doll games when I was little, little league games. And, um, and uh, so mom would let me play until it was time to go to church. And then she'd pick me up and I'd go to church in my uniform. Every Tuesday night, I'd go to church in my uniform. I actually tried to figure out how I could get the dirtiest in the shortest amount of innings before she picked me up, thinking that at one time she would think I was just too dirty to take to church, and I never accomplished it. <laughs> but I get to church, and they do prayer requests on Wednesday night, or the Tuesday night midweek service, you know, and it was all, everybody was there at a small church, so I was together. I'd be the first one to raise my hand. And they knew the answer. When I, to, I, I want our team to win. <laughs> I still pray for my teams to win. But, you know, I, I mean, it's just, I pray, why? Because to a seven, eight, nine-year-old, that was a big deal. And I love that our church just kind of smiled with the eight, nine-year-old learning what it was like to pray. I don't think God ever orchestrated wins or losses, but I think he sure loved the relationship. I, love, I think he loved the interaction. You know, a lot of your kids, if you got little ones and they get lollipops, I always try to steal their lollipop. I do. I got relationships with all kinds of kids here because I try to take their lollipop. I don't want their lollipop. But I love the interaction. I love watching them run away from me. <laughs> and I can make the bunch of them run away from me. We shift, we shift, we have to shift the priority to pray. We do that because it's effective. That's kind of the last one. We move forward in prayer. We move forward, the church moves forward, the gospel moves forward in prayer. Prayer is not a program at a church. Prayer is the lifeblood of our lives. It's the lifeblood of our lives. James tells us this. Therefore, then he prayed again. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, your false steps, your offenses, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, with the same physical, mental, and spiritual limitations and shortcomings. And he prayed intensely for it not to rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its crops. Prayer is effective, and it moves forward. We move forward in prayer. Prayer makes a way in your life. It allows you to advance. We sang about moving mountains. We sang about a way maker. Prayer is a way that we move forward in life. But we also move forward as a church. The kingdom of God moves forward in prayer. Um, in Ephesians Paul goes through this litany of um, the armor of God, it's called. So he talks about the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, uh, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. He, he walks through this. He, he's been teaching us that the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but they're mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds, that, that we, don't fight we don't fight spiritual battles in the flesh, we fight them in the Spirit. And he goes through this armor. And then he says, when he finishes that, then he says, but I want you to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And then he, ended, he ends this, this dialogue with this. He says, and pray that I may preach the gospel as fearless, fearlessly as I should. Prayer moves forward the kingdom. It advances our life and it advances the kingdom. And what I would love to see is more and more people that call Gateway home to turn our prayers, not just reactionary prayers. Team, come on up. Not just reactionary prayers, like something happens and we react to it and pray. But they'd be responsive prayers. That we would pray just as Paul prayed. Listen, the gospel is opposed. We need to pray and push our way into that. That we would pray and push our way into the kingdom. We pray that the gospel would be fearlessly proclaimed in this house. That the darkness would fall to the light. Doesn't it stand to reason 
that the more people praying in that regard, the more response that we're going to have to that prayer. So let's just recap. We want to advance prayer. So we advance it from the standpoint of we are in a relationship with God. The cause of prayer is it builds relationship and we are banking on the relationship. We change the priority of prayer. That prayer isn't something that we get to. Prayer is something that we get to. We, we pray. We don't work our way to it. And the third, that prayer is the way I advance in my life. And prayer is the way we advance the kingdom of God. Now here's the way I want to respond to the message. And I've, we've, we've done this multiple times. And um, if you're a guest, just hold on. It's not that scary. It feels that way, but it's not. We break up four, six or so. You move your chair, move your body. Get, get with some people around you. It's, it's okay to move around. And here's what I'm, telling, I'm saying as a guest. I know it, gets, it gets, could get frightening. You're going to have to meet somebody that you hadn't intended on meeting. But I tell you that the, the, the best, most valuable commodity of a local church are its people. Hands down. And you, you don't understand that until you can look someone in the eye and have them pray for you. That's where a church shows its metal. And so here's what we're going to do. I'll pray two different ways, okay? So in the group, I want you to I want I want someone to 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 lead a prayer for the for the proclamation of the gospel that the gospel will be proclaimed at 1288 Lewisburg Pike, in the fearlessness that it should be, in the fiercestness that it should be proclaimed at all times, and that God people would respond to God. And then I want us to shift. And I want you to be able to articulate a need. Now look, there's not, there's not, this is not the format for you to share 10 minutes on all the nuances of that need, okay? It's not necessary for everybody to understand the story. Maybe you'll make a connect and you can tell them all the story. What your what your what our goal is now is that you get out of your mouth that you've engaged somebody else to pray for you. So as quickly how you can kind of form that and you put it out to the group. And I want to shift and people pray for those needs in that group. Are you with me? It's, it's, it's okay. Even if you're the most introvert, it's okay. Just be a, part, be a part of a group. You don't have to open your mouth. Someone else will. But I'm telling you, this, this, is, a, this is amazing. It's an amazing opportunity. Okay? So let's do that now. I want you to shift. Either move your body or pick your chair, unhook it, get with four, six, eight, whatever. But... Make a move. Yeah, I know. It's the 11 o'clock crowd. You don't want to move. Come on. Let's do it as reverently as we can. We're going to stay in this time. And as soon as you kind of get the group, I want someone to jump in and start praying. There's a hole.
want you to continue to pray, but I want to pray this over us as a body. And Father, my brothers and sisters in Christ are praying today. Lord, I add my prayer to theirs, Lord. And Lord, we ask for an open heaven, if you will, Lord, that we know that it's your presence that changes lives. It's your spirit that fills holes and makes people whole. And Lord, we want to see that more and more and more and more here. Lord, I want to see it in the relationships of the men and women in this room. Lord, I pray that they would speak the words of the gospel as fiercely and as fear fearlessly as they should. Father, believing that when, when you're lifted up, Lord, all men are drawn to you. And Father, we want to see men and women and students and kids, Lord, we want to see we want to see people drawn to you. So, Lord, we, we ask. Lord, we ask for your favor. Lord, we ask for your power. Lord, I pray that we would see more marriages healed than we ever have. More relationships with kids and parents healed than we've ever had. Lord, more people finding you for the first time, more than we've ever had. More people surrendering their life direction to you than we've ever had. Lord, as we follow in obedience to you, Lord, more provision than we've ever had. Lord, we only exist to follow you to worship you, to proclaim you. And Father, as we pray for the needs of one another, as we lend our faith to one another, we share our faith and our prayer with one another. Lord, I believe your word is true, and Lord, that you hear the petitions of your people. And so, Lord, I pray that you would replace worry and anxiousness and fear in this moment, Lord, with security, Lord, with love, Lord, with a plan. Help us to continue to believe, Father, that even when we don't see you, you're working. Be our way maker today, Father.
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That, that's who we engage in. That, that's what should raise and advance prayer. That's what advances prayer. Not that somehow I've got to pray more to somehow measure up to some unrealistic. My, my prayer is going to come out of relationship. My prayer is going to come out of my trust. And my prayer is going to be birthed out of need too. But I'm, I'm only going to come if I trust. That's what makes it not a last resort, but a first approach. Waymaker. God who calls things that are not as if they were. I should actually pray more the worse I feel. The less faith I have should actually be an indicator that I need to pray more, not less. I don't, I don't pray with my face riding high. Those are more like drive-by prayers for me with my face riding high. Thank you, God. I'm off. I'm, I'm out doing my thing. I get serious. I get serious when things sometimes aren't going the best, and I hang tight with God long enough to be reminded of His relationship with me, and then I go, "Wow, I really missed this. I really missed this." If you're a guest with us today, and you stayed through our prayer, it's great having you be a part of our worship service today. Really, Pastor Chris and his team. We all love to get a chance to meet you. We have a gift for you. We were expecting you to come today. That's why we have a gift for you. 
for the rest, let's not forget, we only had a couple more Sundays, actually, in this building. I remember we broke ground for this building. There was a, I don't know, but only about 100 of us circled up in the field. Kids had shovels. I told everybody, go home, get a shovel, and show back up in the afternoon. They did, and kind of stuck a shovel in the ground. We didn't get a chance to stick a shovel in this ground. It was too wet. We'd had to have a sieve, right? But uh, two weeks in here, two weeks at West Harpeth Primitive Baptist Church, and then part of the building will be done. And we'll get to enjoy one another in that as well. Now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up and you're laying down and going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.